name is uh, Jihoon Lee. I'm from NVIDIA in Santa Clara and from the headquarter. And today I'll be talking about uh, how deep neural network is changing the landscape for automotive uh, industry and especially for the autonomous vehicles. Uh, so I will be uh, talking about mainly on the uh, how AI is affecting this landscape. Close. Okay, so first uh, I'll start by uh, talking about the uh, NVIDIA's, uh, how NVIDIA's GPU is helping this uh, rise up the uh, computing. So as you, as you can see in this graph uh, on the right, um, the CPUs has been scaling uh, years and years and years uh, following the Moore's law. And uh, at some point we, uh, reach the uh, end of the Moore's law. So the transistors does not scale anymore. And uh, CPUs are designed for uh, single-threaded uh, applications. And even if you throw more uh, CPUs to uh, add multi-cores, it's not very efficient at uh, processing large parallel data. So uh, the GPUs, uh, the NVIDIA designed the GPUs originally for uh, graphics. So uh, it was originally intended for the uh, games, but we also found that um, it's v because we are building such a large parallel processors, it can be used for uh, general purpose uh, computing. So that's uh, how we come up with the CUDA. Is a CUDA is a GPU programming uh, language that NVIDIA invented. Uh, it actually started uh, 12 years ago, and uh, the first GPU that uh, supported this uh, general purpose computing in M from NVIDIA was a uh, uh, 8800 uh, series. So since then, we invested uh, a lot of resources to make this available on every single GPU that we ship. So if you go buy any NVIDIA GPU, CUDA is an API that you can use to program for, uh, program your parallel algorithms uh, running on the GPU. And by uh, doing this, we can uh, continue to scale our performance and you can see that uh, by 2025, uh, we expect to reach uh, 1,000x. The single threaded CPU uh, was able to do uh, 20, 30 years ago. And then, uh, and then it came, there came uh, the big bang of the AI uh, a couple of years ago. So uh, there's three major components that you need uh, to be able to successfully uh, deploy your uh, AI algorithm. So the first component is the big data. So you need a lot of data uh, to train your neural network to produce a good result, as well as you need the parallel algorithms. So uh, as Sam talked about the, uh, the training of a forward, forward uh, pass and the backward propagation you need to do to train your network. And there has been a lot of advances in the parallel algorithm which can train this neural network very efficiently. And the third component is the GPU uh, computing. So uh, NVIDIA uh, CUDA enabled uh, very large parallel processors to be, used this for, uh, to be used for this training of the neural network. And when all these three things comes together, that's when we start to see the really good results on the AI field, and we call that a big bang of the AI. So here are some of the milestones, key milestones that, that has uh, become very famous recently. So Hasem already showed you this Atari games uh, using deep re reinforcement learning. Uh, the computers are now able to play games better than human, and this, uh, in around like uh, end of 2015, that's the first time uh, the deep neural networks was able to reach hum uh, superhuman uh, capability when it comes to image classification task. So at this point, computers were better than human in terms of recognizing what the picture was. And early 2016 was when uh, many of you may, heard, may uh, have seen this uh, event in Korea, so Google's DeepMind AlphaGo played the uh, world champion of the uh, ancient game of Go, 
and the possibility of the moves in the go uh, is is 19 to, to the uh, 19 something. So it's basically infinite moves that you can make. And people thought this would be impossible for a computer to beat a human. And AlphaGo actually uh, was able to beat the human champion of the Go. And then the Microsoft research uh, was able to come up with a, a speech recognition uh, neural network uh, that was uh, on the parity with a human uh, level. And also, uh, at the end of the last year, there was a uh, lip reading network. Uh, so it was, they were able to design a neural network that uh, performed better than a professional lip reading person. So these are all the uh, major AI breakthroughs uh, that happened recently. Uh, and that's probably why so many people are now interested in, in this AI. So it's, uh, if you look at this chart, you can see the AI is improving at an amazing rate. So you can see that uh, since the GPU uh, deep learning came, then people started uh, all using the GPUs to train a large network to achieve uh, much, much better accuracy on, on the many of the tasks that was uh, deemed impossible before. So ImageNet accuracy is, uh, we, we're already reaching a superhuman uh, accuracy. And the speech recognition, uh, we are as good as humans now. So because of all these AI advances, uh, we believe AI is the uh, solution to the self-driving problem. So uh, there's many problems that you need to solve in the self-driving. Uh, the perception is the, definitely the main uh, problem that you need to solve. So as a human, you're, when you're driving, uh, you're looking at the roads and watching the surround, surrounding and then trying to figure out the world around you. So that's the perception part. And then the reasoning is actually understanding what you see. So uh, you also need to uh, be able to uh, understand where the cars around you are moving and be able to predict the path. So you need to reason about the world that you're perceiving. And then uh, finally, based on this understanding of the world, uh, you need to actuate the cars to, so you can actually drive. And then there's uh, another component, uh, uh, HD map and the uh, map. Uh, so these will be uh, uh, another key solution where you need to uh, basically complement uh, your perception. So with the prior knowledge when you're driving to an area where, where you are already uh, familiar with, it's much easier to drive. So you can think of these HD maps as a prior knowledge that you have about the world. So you can uh, make better decisions about the uh, self-driving. So all of this uh, is enabled by the AI computing now. So let's talk about uh, what kind of things that NVIDIA is doing in terms of deep learning for autonomous driving. So uh, here's a brief introduction of deep neural network. Uh, I won't spend too much time. So as you add more uh, neurons and more layers, you're able to capture more information. So larger networks tends to uh, perform better at a complex task. And that means you need to build a, a large network and it, it requires a lot of uh, computation power. So, okay, sorry about that. So uh, the first uh, problem that we're solving with the deep learning is uh, a problem of multi-class object detection and classification. So based on the camera inputs, uh, we need to be able to locate where the uh, objects are uh, in the image as well as classify what the image is. So in this example here, uh, it's, the, uh, it's showing an NVIDIA's network uh, where we are detecting the location of the, of the object. And uh, you can see the boxes are labeled with the different colors that corresponds to a different class of the objects. So 
This is one of the network that we use in our self-driving car. And the second network that we're developing is uh, for uh, detection of the lanes. So uh, in this example, uh, you can see the two eagle lanes in the middle. So the left is the eagle left lane, and the green is the eagle, eagle right. Then you can also detect the adjacent lanes uh, on the road. So you can also detect the yellow and blue uh, lanes using this. And uh, if you, this is important key, key uh, information that you need uh, if you're trying to uh, make a lane change, for example, or if you're trying to stay in the middle of the lane, uh, you'll need this uh, information. And another network that we are uh, developing at NVIDIA is uh, we, we, what we call a free space detection network. It's actually a segmentation network. Uh, it's uh, similar to a pixel level segmentation that Hassan mentioned. Uh, but instead of uh, labeling per pixel, uh, like every, every pixel on the image, what we are doing here is uh, we are capturing the boundary of where the free uh, space is so that the network can tell us uh, what area is safe to drive to versus uh, what areas uh, we need to uh, pay attention to. And uh, another output that's coming out from this network is the, the classification of the, uh, the objects at the boundary. So at the boundary of this line, uh, you can see that the uh, green line means the curves of the road. And then you can have uh, cars or pedestrians. Uh, so we have uh, different classes that uh, we labeled in our data set. And we are able to uh, not just uh, detect the free space, but also uh, have more information about what kind of object is at the boundary. So you can think of this network as a, a complementary of um, the detection and uh, classification network that we are having. And uh, it's always better to have a redundancy information uh, in case uh, you need uh, to, to make it uh, safer to drive around you. So we, we are using all of these networks together to uh, understand the, the world around the vehicle. And another network, uh, besides the perception uh, that we are working on, is uh, what we call a pylon net. So this pylon net is an end-to-end -end, uh, autonomous driving network. So what that means is uh, given the input uh, image, the output of the network is the actual uh, actuation command uh, to the car. So before, if you look at our perception networks, uh, what the network was predicting was uh, where the object is and uh, what the object is and this information about uh, the, the wall. But if you actually think about how humans drive, you don't necessarily actually uh, try to detect every single object around you and try to track them. Rather, you're actually uh, looking at the, uh, the road ahead of you and then you're making decisions to where to go based on that information. So we're trying to uh, build this network uh, that's mimicking the human behavior. And um, in this slide, uh, what's very interesting about this network is um, even though we're not explicitly telling the network to detect the lanes, for example, if you look at uh, how network is actually, uh, what where the network is paying attention to, you can see this green, uh, so we, we visualized how the network is actually uh, perceiving the image. And the visualization tells us that the network is actually paying attention to uh, the edges of the road, even though we, we didn't explicitly uh, train the network this way. And this is um, similar to how human would drive. Like you have to understand some boundary of things and uh, be able, in order for you to be able to drive. And we have a, a paper published uh, recently on this network. So you can find more information about how we uh, designed this network and trained it. So uh, on the right-hand side, uh, this is an architecture of our network. So it's basically a convolutional neural network that's taking uh, the camera image as an input. 
and uh, it's a nine layer uh, network with a uh, five convolution layer and uh, some pooling layers and uh, the final layers are uh, uh, actually before the final layer there's a one normalization layer and this uh, network can output the actuation command uh, directly using this architecture. So uh, I talked about like, what kind of networks that NVIDIA is uh, developing uh, to enable this uh, autonomous driving. But let's uh, also talk about how we're um, using our GPUs to enable this, all this uh, network. So NVIDIA uh, provides a complete deep learning platform. So uh, on the server side, uh, we provide um, frameworks and softwares uh, that you can use to train your network easily. But uh, we don't stop there. We actually have a, a deployment solution as well. So uh, on the same uh, GPUs, uh, we have a, a software called the Tenger RT, where uh, we optimize the network for the inference performance. And the network can be deployed on the, uh, any of the, our GPU-based uh, hardwares. So I'll talk a little bit more about each of these uh, in the next coming slides. So on the training side, uh, NVIDIA has a, uh, what we call a DGX1. Uh, we recently announced a new version uh, with a Tesla Volta V100 GPUs. And uh, this DGX1 is uh, basically an AI supercomputer that you can use to train your neural network uh, very fast. Uh, DGX1, based on the Volta, has uh, eight V100 GPUs. And combined together, uh, we have uh, also a high-speed interconnect link called the MB-Link. And using these, uh, we provide up to uh, 960 teraflops of uh, computing power here. So you can use this uh, platform to train your network very fast. And on the deployment side, uh, especially for the self-driving cars, uh, we have a platform called the Drive PX2. And uh, we have a next generation coming up uh, named the Xavier. And Drive PX2 is uh, available right now. And you can use it to develop all your algorithms. And we actually position this as a development platform. And uh, for your production, you can use a Xavier uh, when it's available. But what's uh, nice about it is that because we're using one architecture called the CUDA, uh, all the software that you develop in our current development platform uh, will nicely migrate. Uh, and you don't have to worry about the compatibility of the software when you uh, move to the Xavier. So you can start your development uh, right now using uh, existing hardware. And in, in the Drive PX2, uh, it's actually a system where we have uh, two Parker SOCs on the top, as well as uh, we have uh, two uh, Pascal-based discrete GPU as an accelerator. And combined together, it provides 20 teraflops of uh, computing power uh, for your deep learning inference. But when we go to Xavier, uh, it's actually a single chip SOC solution, which uh, will provide uh, 30 teraflops of uh, deep learning inference performance. So, uh, this, uh, this large computing system, uh, we're actually going to make it very small and be usable uh, for your deployment in, uh, in the car. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Volta GPU that uh, we recently announced. So what's uh, new in this Volta GPU is uh, something called the Tensor Core. So as, as you are familiar with uh, how deep learning is used, uh, and trained, uh, you need a lot of uh, matrix multiplications in order for you to train and uh, do the inference of the network. So um, in the Volta generation of the GPUs, uh, we added a special unit called the Tensor Core. And what it can do is basically, um, it can do uh, massive, massively parallel processing of matrix uh, multiplications. So uh, compared to Pascal, uh, Volta provides 12 times uh, 
training performance and six times inference performance uh, for the same number of uh, GPU cores. So this is a huge leap in terms of uh, uh, deep learning performance in, the, in our next generation GPU. And now let's talk about um, how we can use all these uh, nice NVIDIA hardware to actually uh, train your network. So the first step is uh, you need a lot of data. And you can use uh, our DrivePX2 to start collecting the data. So DrivePX2, you can connect up to 12 uh, GMSR cameras. And you can also connect the LIDARs and radars and GPSs and whatever sensors that you need to uh, collect. And you can also, uh, we have an interface that talks directly to the car's CAN bus. So you can uh, collect information about um, what's going on in the car as well. And uh, we, we have a, a 10 gigabit Ethernet port available on the Drive PX2. And you can use that uh, as an interface to the uh, storage uh, for fast, um, fast, uh, fast access to the storage that you need. Because uh, the amount of data you, that you need to collect here is huge. So you need large uh, disk and also very, very fast uh, disk. So that's the interface that we use to uh, capture the data. And then uh, once you collect all this data, uh, typically it's the video data. So the first step uh, of your data set creation is actually uh, curation. So uh, we are collecting typically in a 30 frames per second. And if you look at all the subsequent frames, there's very little difference between the frames. So in order to train your network uh, that does interesting things. Uh, you need to selectively choose what frames are actually uh, interested to you. So we call that uh, process of data curation. And the second step is the, the data annotation. So in this example, uh, we are showing an example where we are labeling the image for uh, pixel level segmentation. Or on the left hand side, maybe this is uh, for uh, object detection. So the bounding boxes will tell the location of the object and also the uh, labels for the uh, object. And um, another thing you can do uh, is if you already have some sort of train network, maybe you can start from there and uh, be able to reduce the amount of data. Uh, so it's uh, called transfer learning. So if you have an existing data with some train network, you can also start from there instead of starting from the scratch. So once you finish collecting all the data, uh, you can start uh, training your neural, deep neural networks. And NVIDIA has a, a software called the Digits. Uh, it's our GPU training uh, software. Uh, it's basically an interface uh, to underlying deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow or CAFE that you're familiar with. And what's nice about it is uh, it provides a very easy to use interface to manage your data and configure, and then you can also monitor your uh, training uh, process. So as you're training the network, uh, you can see the, uh, the accuracy is going up and the loss is going down. And you can have a better feeling of whether your training is going in the right direction or not. And another nice feature is the visualization. So we provide a lot of uh, tools that you, you can use to understand what's going on in the network. So uh, yeah, so as you're monitoring uh, the training process, you can tell that uh, if you have a network that's learning, uh, so your accuracy is going up and then your loss is going down, that's uh, the well-behaved training. Uh, there could be some problems with the, uh, as you're training your network. So typical problem is the overfeeding problem. So if you have uh, data that's uh, too skewed in, in, in one direction, uh, your network may end up learning that very particular uh, input data, and you may end up with overfeeding. So by observing these uh, uh, trends in, as you're training, you can detect whether um, your network is going to be converging into a good state or not, and you can abort your training if it's not going well, and try different uh, hyperparameters or change your data set. 
So uh, here's an example of how fast you can train your network. Uh, so in this case, the uh, example is a ResNet 50, and uh, it needs 90 epochs to solution. So if you're just using the CPUs, uh, it will take uh, 700 hours. But if you use a, a DGX zone with the Volta GPUs, you can finish the training in 7.4 uh, hours. So that gives you an advantage of uh, being able to try many different experiments as you're uh, training your network. So that's uh, how you would train your network uh, using our uh, DGX1 servers. Now we, let's talk about how we can actually uh, deploy this train network on a car. Uh, and as you can imagine, the inferencing uh, is not actually very cheap. Uh, you still need a lot of computing power in order to able to inference all your DNNs in the car. So our solution to that is uh, called a Tenger RT, and it's basically a, a software that takes your train network as an input, and then we perform all the optimizations uh, for our target hardware that NVIDIA uh, is providing. And it's fully automated, so you don't have to, uh, you don't have to uh, interfere too much when you're using this tool. It's basically, uh, you invoke the tool, you give the uh, input network, the output is the optimized uh, runtime that you can deploy in your uh, drive PX, for example. Uh, another thing uh, that TenGRT is enabling is a low precision inference. So Hassan mentioned that uh, during the training, you typically need the uh, FP32 uh, precision. But during the inference, uh, we can actually do a good job using uh, either 16-bit or 8-bit precision. So Tenger RT uh, will do the quantization uh, to this uh, low precision deployment as well. And NVIDIA uh, GPU has a uh, hardware for this low precision arithmetics. And for this low precision arithmetics, uh, the throughput is much higher on the M NVIDIA GPU. So uh, Tenger RT performs uh, many different optimizations. So Typical optimization that you can uh, think of is a fuse, fusion of network layers. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about why this is important. And uh, another thing is that we also do auto tuning on the target platform. So given so many different ways of computing the same algorithm, uh, it's hard to predict what would be the best algorithm to use to uh, inference your network. So TenGRT will take care of that uh, automatically. And uh, it's also tuned for a given batch size. So uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about these details uh, in my next slide. So here's an example of graph optimization. So here you're looking at uh, something similar to uh, Google's inception uh, module here. So you have a parallel pass to uh, different set of convolution operations. So you have one by one here, one by one followed by three by three, one by one followed by five by five, and then you have another path here. And then all of that has to be concatenated before it goes to the next uh, set of layers for further processing. So how do we uh, optimize this using TenGRT? So the first thing that we do is called the vertical fusion. So if you compare uh, this previous graph with this new graph. You can see uh, we're combining the convolution uh, and the bias and activation into a single kernel. And the advantage of doing this fusion is that um, between the kernel um, invocations, you're actually writing out the results to the memory and then reading back for the next kernel. So you're getting rid of the unnecessary memory traffic as well as uh, you're reducing the kernel launch latency, uh, kernel launch overhead of the GPU. So uh, this is the first step of the optimization called the vertical fusion. Uh, next step is to fuse the, uh, the same size kernels uh, horizontally. So if you look at these three one by one uh, convolutions, they're actually operating on the same input. So what that actually means is these three blocks 
let's say if this one has uh, four filters, this one has a uh, four filters, and this one also has, has four filters, you can combine them to create a one large uh, convolution block that operates on a 12 filters in, 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 a, in parallel. Then you can uh, redirect the output to the, uh, the corresponding consumer. That way, uh, you're, uh, you're basically processing more uh, in parallel. That's, and GPUs are very good at parallel processing, and you can improve the performance this way. Uh, another thing we do is uh, called the concatenation illusion. So if you are familiar with the, what concatenation is, it's basically a memory <laughs> copy. Uh, you're reformatting uh, the output of the previous layer and then combine them into a single uh, memory where you're just copying the data to a different location for the next layer. So uh, by analyzing the graph statically and understanding where the output should go, we can get rid of these unnecessary memory copies. So when you combine all these optimizations, uh, uh, sorry, uh, you can achieve very good inference performance uh, on DrivePX2. So on the DrivePX2, I mentioned there's a Parker SOC as well as a discrete GPU as an accelerator. So the iGPU uh, is actually inside the Parker SOC. Uh, it's a rather small processor, but it's already uh, producing uh, very fast inference performance on these networks. And another thing um, you can look at is the, uh, the discrete GPU, the Pascal discrete GPU on the DrivePX2. It has an integer eight uh, inference capability in the hardware. So we can take advantage of uh, low precision inference and get much better uh, performance on, on this platform. So if you compare these two, uh, you can see it's a different magnitude. Uh, and DrivePX2 Drive has two of these discrete GPUs that you can use to accelerate your uh, DNS in the car. So how do you actually do this uh, low precision inference? So Tenjiro RT will basically um, take care of the quantization for you. But uh, what we are doing here is uh, something called the real cali re uh, calibration. So the algorithm underneath it is, uh, is actually what we call an entropy calibration algorithm. It's based on the uh, information theory of uh, uh, distribution. So if you are familiar with the kolbeck leibler uh, divergence, that's the metric that we use to approximate the full precision uh, distribution of the network output into a low precision uh, output. So if you, if you think of uh, your full precision FP32 network producing some kind of distribution of the outputs for each of the layers, you can approximate that distribution uh, using smaller number of bits. In this case, we're using uh, eight bits to approximate the original distribution. And uh, the algorithm basically minimizes the loss between the two distributions. So that's how we are approaching this quantization problem. And uh, here's some results that we get using Tenjiro RT. Uh, so you're not going to get the exact same accuracy as before because you're, you're actually losing some information. But as you can see here, uh, the difference is very, very minimal. But uh, if you consider the performance gain that you can get uh, from going to low precision, you can see that it, it, this is definitely worthwhile uh, optimization that you can use when you're deploying your network. Okay, so I talked from uh, how you collect the data to train and deploy your network. So I covered all the end-to-end -end flow. And uh, now I'll talk a little bit about uh, the challenges that we see in the autonomous driving going forward. So, so here are some of the very, very challenging uh, situations that we, we, we can see. So if you ever been to some uh, Southeast Asian countries, this is the how road may look like. And people are able to maneuver through this kind of situations. Uh, so this is one of the situations if you really want the self-driving cars to be safely drive, uh, this is one of the challenges. 
Another challenge is uh, if you're using uh, cameras, uh, computer visions to solve your problem, the sensor could be uh, blocked by a bad weather, uh, rain, for example. Or you may run into a construction zone where uh, your map tells you that it's safe to drive, but in reality, there's something uh, blocking your way, and you have to be able to understand this and be able to reason about it and uh, drive around it. Uh, on paved road, uh, some of the very complicated uh, rotary here. Uh, I don't know how many people have seen this kind of uh, traffic signs, but there's so many different types of traffic signs in the world that uh, it's really interesting if you just look at uh, the variety of the signs that you have to be able to understand. It's a uh, mind-boggling challenge. So these are all very different, uh, difficult situations. But, um, but there's also uh, moral challenges. So um, in this left-hand side example, uh, if you have uh, one person in front, of a, in front of your vehicle versus many people, um, is it, do you have to avoid, like, is it better to avoid multiple people or a single person? Like, it's hard to, as an engineer, uh, you can define some metrics, but that's probably not the right way to solve this kind of problem. So there has to be a lot of legal and ethical uh, issues to be solved in this space. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, if you build your network to be able to detect, uh, for example, pedestrians and animals, if you go into a country where there's, uh, for example, Australia, where there's a kangaroo, if you've never driven there, like the, your if you don't have a data to train this kind of animal, uh, your network will not be able to uh, detect this correctly. And uh, I think this was, uh, recently there was an accident happened by the autonomous uh, vehicle. I think it was one of the companies was doing the testing in the Australia and then ran into this issue. So these are all kinds of interesting challenges we need to solve going forward. So let's put everything uh, that I talked about together. So if I have a network that can do the perception and the planning, uh, and if we solve all the problems together, uh, and we actually <coughs> make the car drive um, using these AI algorithms, um, you can imagine something like this. So there's a video. A short video. Take me to Starbucks and stand my tail. I wanna live like this Mardi Gras with a phone car and an entourage. Hey, don't need no armor now to regular life. I say I was hey, living life in the fast lane. May your pain only be champagne. <laughs> so please come join me. One thing, good vibes only. I just cash my check. One thing, good vibes only. I just cash my check. Yeah. I ain't paying rent. No, no. I just quit my job. Okay. Told them all get long. Don't care who you are. Don't care, Don't care where you're from. We all got one thing in common. We just wanna have fun. Hey. So what you wanna do? So what you wanna do? So do it. Engage autopilot. Okay, so that concludes my talk. Uh, I have some links where you can go find more information about what I talked about today. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions.
So who has any questions? Yes. Hi. So if you have a car with all these networks and uh, the car is still learning, the networks are still learning, or that so was my f would be my first question? So the question is uh, whether the cars that we are uh, using is learning as it's yeah, driving? Yeah, the networks in the car when they're driving, they are still learning, or? Uh, we don't do that today. Um, we usually uh, have a cl data collection vehicle that goes around and collect the data, and then you have to label the data and uh, we train our network on, on a data uh, server on the using DGX1 clusters. And then uh, once you have an update model, we can um, over the air update the, the vehicles, but we, we don't do the in-car training today. Okay, and then I think the second question is just uh, for fun. Um, and in the future, they should exchange their knowledge. So if one make an experience, you know, they say, um, if you're a personal driver, you have an accident, you learn in this situation to behave different. And the thing with uh, these networks of, uh, networks of cars is that then they can ex exchange their knowledge and then they make not the same mistake every car for its own. Yeah, so uh, definitely. So uh, the DNS don't actually tell you how confident your prediction is. Uh, it especially for if you're doing a classification. Um, the softmax doesn't actually tell you the probability uh, directly. So if you want to understand um, where you're having trouble with, like for example, like unexpected situations where your uh, DNN is not sure of how to handle, what we need, what we need in the vehicle is uh, a metric that you can use as you're driving around and be able to tell, uh, okay, here's a situation that I'm not certain about. So uh, in those situations, you can definitely think about you know, multiple fleet of cars driving around and then collecting this data that is, uh, that is not, uncert not certain about and then you, know, you have to be able to share the knowledge. So that's definitely uh, one of the research areas. Uh, I have uh, two questions. <laughs> okay. um, the first one, uh, I was at the autonomous driving meetup long time ago, six months or eight months ago with uh, Audi uh, VW and they were working with NVIDIA and there was the question of drive PX being uh, fast or fast enough or not fast enough in operation. So what is the current maximum speed limit for the car with drive PX and uh, with Xavier will it be higher because the recognition rate was uh, so, so are you talking about the vehicle speed itself or? Yeah, because in a vehicle, uh, if you have 12 or 16 sensors, like cameras, lidar, radar, and all this, and you collect all this data and you need to reach a certain frequency of, a rec of recognition. At 100 kil uh, kilometers per hour, you have to recognize higher than 200, even higher, and so on. And there was a speed limit with drive PX at the moment. Yeah, I'm not aware of that limit off my head, or I don't even know if that limit exists. I, and I think it depends on the situation and the problem that you're trying to solve. So highway driving, uh, surprisingly, is not uh, the most difficult situation. Uh, I believe the urban driving situation is, could be more challenging when you're going lower speed, uh, because there are so many uh, unexpected things that can happen, right? Uh, the pedestrian can jump onto the road or there will be a bicycle or so um, yeah so to answer your original question I don't know the answer uh, but I don't think uh, like high speed is necessarily the most challenging situation to solve. Well actually there was someone from NVIDIA saying drive PX is not recommended for higher than what certain speed with the Audi because of all the data coming in and we should wait for the next uh, chip like probably Xavier, they didn't want to talk about it at that time. And okay. that would be. Uh, yeah, I don't know the background of the discussion you had with the NVIDIA person, so. <laughs> <laughs> the second one is probably a lot easier. How much does a DJX1 cost? How, <laughs> if, much? how much does a uh, Tesla Volta. Um, uh, DJX1, the cost of the DJX1? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to give the wrong answer. Shall we? Shall we? You know? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, well, I, I think we need these numbers <laughs> out loud. 150,000. But okay. there's, of course, discount for academic research um, startups. So that's one incentive to join the inception program that NVIDIA has. Okay. Thank you. So many. So uh, we need the GPU for the training the data. So do we need still the GPU in the lab or for the testing phase? Uh, so the question is, do we need GPU for the inference? Yeah. So um, it really depends on what you're trying to do and uh, what your network looks like and uh, what kind of algorithms you're running. So we believe uh, you will need a lot of processing power and I'm not aware of any other uh, processor today that you can buy uh, will give uh, equivalent performance as our NVIDIA GPUs uh, for in-car inference. So uh, if you look at our Drive PX2, the combined throughput of the uh, platform is uh, 20 teraflops, And in Xavier, uh, we are targeting 30 teraflops. Uh, but whether that's enough for uh, truly like L4, L5 self-driving, that's an open question because we have not solved all the problems that we need to solve in the algorithm levels. And without the algorithm, we can't tell uh, exactly how much uh, performance you will need to uh, run all your algorithms in the car. So uh, the way that NVIDIA is uh, designing our GPU is our best you know, guess at what the people might need, uh, you know, this 20 teraflops and 30 teraflop processor is uh, what we think uh, we, you should need to uh, enable the self-driving cars. But it really depends on uh, what your, uh, what your algorithm is and what your network looks like. OK, thank you. Um, hi. Uh, I have a question about um, data imbalance because this is something that uh, is often a challenging practice that when you have a big biases in your training data uh, for example let's say you have 90% uh, of the data is from the daytime and then you only have like 10% of the data from the nighttime how can you ensure the performance is working as well on the in the night as in the day how do you deal with this kind of imbalances in the data? So um, that's an interesting question. So the question is uh, if you have a different, very, very different uh, data, for example, that during the day versus the during the night, and how do you balance your data? Um, so we are experimenting with uh, many different uh, combinations and trying to find the answer ourselves. Um, I don't know if I can tell you like the distribution you're using today, but uh, it's basically, uh, it's not just your data, it's also your uh, DNN architecture. So if you have a uh, mix of day and night data, um, it means to the network that you actually need to be able to capture more information. So that probably means you have to increase your uh, size of the network as well. So uh, it's not like you're fixing the network and just tr playing with the, uh, the data. You also have to keep changing your network until you find out the, the best mix of the two. So uh, I think it's a research question. So um, I just want to understand, like, uh, why do you always compare GPUs with CPUs? Like, for example, like we have, we all have home, home computers, and we have a GPU and we have a CPU. So GPUs are like accelerators. They rather so, like, why don't you compare yourself with accelerators rather than G CPUs, like FPGAs or DSPs? So why do you always compare yourself with CPU? CPU is a c completely different uh, concept, so. Yeah, so, so some of the slides I didn't make myself. Um, it came from, well, it's a, 
I, I, to answer that question, is more the slide itself was uh, comparison was more geared towards the data center. You know, data center uh, today, at least uh, the main processor is the CPU. Uh, it's true that you know FPGAs and DSPs are coming along, especially in the uh, self-driving the car deployment side, but. Uh, we actually don't have, like, in our hands, like, access to these, uh, the chips they claim to be, you know, good performance. Like, in order for us to benchmark against the competitor, we need to have access to that chip. But um, it's all on the paper today. Uh, but GP is something you can go buy right now. Uh, so until we'll s we see the actual, you know, product, we cannot do the fair comparison. Okay. Uh, maybe just a sh short question. Uh, is it possible or will this be possible to use t TensorRT with TensorFlow? And it's yes. First uh, uh, actually, uh, just last week at GTC China, we announced the uh, TensorRT 3, which supports the TensorFlow. So you'll be able to use TensorRT on a TensorFlow model. Okay. And the second question, where are you experimenting with the recurrent networks in autonomous driving context? So, uh, so far we haven't seen uh, much of a use of uh, RNNs, uh, at least in, in the autonomous driving. But I do see some papers coming out uh, doing some kind of tracking algorithm using RNNs. Uh, and you know, if, if there is a need, uh, you know, definitely it's something we can uh, work with. Uh, TensorRT already uh, is able to optimize the uh, RNNs and LSTMs. Yeah, but apparently you can do some prediction with R RNNs. So if you have the past, basically, you can extrapolate to the future much better. So Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, so if you are using the past data from the past, basically, and feeding into the current network, the past data, so you're basically extrapolating the model into the future by RNN. So I'm uh, wondering whether it has been tested just for, instead of using some simple Kalman pro uh, projection or something like this. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I understood your question. Um. Um, okay, so we can clarify the offline then, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Couple last ones. No more hands, all right? Yeah. Okay. So thank you again for a nice talk. I think we still have like a bit of time, so you feel free to talk to each other. And um, yeah, remember that on Tuesdays there is another meet meetup happening, so feel free to register. Thank you again. At least we have recording, so like if there are no slides, uh, you can take from there. But I think they're also going to share. Like I will uh, ask speakers and we'll okay. share there, on, there will on Slack at least. Slack, uh, Twitter, maybe also Meetup. So, most likely all of them. I can share like on Meetup at least as well. Yeah, yeah if you share it on Meetup.